Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Continuing with Aspen India's objective to promote open dialogue, I welcome you all today to this discussion, which promises to be an interesting one. Not only it involves discussions on China, but also because we have two distinguished speakers on the dais. Martin Jack and Ambassador Vinod Khanna. Ambassador Khanna, our chair for today, specializes in Chinese affairs and had served as head of East Asia in MEA. He is also the co-author of India and China, The Way Ahead and the Ramayana in Indonesia, and has written many articles on India-China relations and China's foreign relations. May I request both of you to please come on the stage. Over to you, Ambassador Khanna. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and my distinguished foreign, former foreign secretary, my former boss, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is an honor to be asked by Aspen Institute to chair the discussion uh, of Martin's book, um, When China Rules the World. Uh, I had a little discussion with the author um, as we, before we climbed in as to what is the <coughs> correct way of pronouncing uh, his family name. Um, and the reason I, I tell you this is because the first time I encountered this, as some of you may have done, is when way back in college, reading As You Like It of Shakespeare. You know, there's that marvelous character. We all called him Yuck. But the day before yesterday, I found him being introduced as Jakes. And now he has assured me that that name can be pronounced as you like it. <laughs> Depending in which country you are. The Chinese have decided that it is going to be Jaka or some such thing. Mading Jaka. There it is. So, the, well, the, it is a, uh, a book which is, um, our thing, thing is the discussion on a book uh, which is already a global bestseller, as it says here. Um, and of course, so it is, you know, the title itself is. Uh, very sort of naturally provocative and promises a lot and apparently the book which I got yesterday and therefore I've not really had a chance to go through all of it but I've skipped through pages um, and read about 150 or so and it does promises to be really it is and I quote now from somebody more eminent than me um, one of the leading intellectuals of the world Eric Hobsbawm who says this important book deeply considered full of historical understanding and realism, is about more than China. It is about 21st century, uh, oh sorry, it is about a 21st century world, no longer modeled on and shaped by North Atlantic power ideas and assumptions. I suspect it will be highly influential, quote unquote. Um, well, I suppose in the course of um, Martin's presentation, he will tell us, um, why he thinks that uh, China will rule the world and also perhaps he will also clarify as to what exactly he means by the phrase rules the world because it could really uh, mean very many different things and reading through the book I find it's a little more subtle than the um, title chosen by the publishers uh, with your consent um, says um, secondly the you know the um, uh, and then I think that's so much of the argument of the book, in what way, once China becomes increasingly more dominant um, actor on the world stage, in what way will the world look different from what it uh, looks uh, today? Um, we are already lost about 10 minutes, so I'm not going to take all of my five minutes. So out of those 10 minutes, I'm saving by speaking for team, uh, three minutes. Now, the, as we have agreed, um, Martin's presentation would be somewhere about 35 to 40 minutes um, and then because I can see this here is an audience um, 
which will look forward greatly to the interactive session that follows. Martin, the floor is yours. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much you know, for those kind uh, words. And, um, it's an honor to come and speak to you. Um, I, um, this is my first uh, visit to India since the book was published. Um, and uh, I've been looking forward to it. Uh, you probably don't know this, but um, in all the writing of this book, which started a long time ago, um, China and India are deeply interwoven um, because my <coughs> wife was Indian Malaysian and um, she died in very tragic circumstances in a Hong Kong hospital. So, um, so this is uh, a journey and a tour I had to do at a personal level. Now, China presents us with two problems. First of all, uh, we've never seen the like of this before. A country of 1.3 billion people growing. You want me to use this? Okay. Um, a, a country of 1.3 billion people uh, growing at 10% uh, a year. I mean, America, when it was growing very quickly. It's industrialization period from the end of the Civil War till 1914 was growing at 3.5% on average. And that was obviously a much smaller country in terms of population. Now, when the whole thing started in 1978, China was very small, 1 20th of the size of the American economy. So its impact was extremely limited. In fact, it's fair to say that until 2000, the transformation of China was mainly the transformation of China and nothing else. But by the turn of the century, the economy began to reach a size uh, which meant that its growth had much wider repercussions, firstly in East Asia and around the world. And so the transformation of China became and now is the transformation of the world. And that, I suppose, is one of the sources of its great fascination. But, of course, everywhere, every government in the world, every people in the world, are trying to find ways to understand it and respond to it, not least in China itself, because it's confronted the Chinese government with you know, colossal problems. Uh, everything is done in a rush, and you know something about this living in India, of course. The second problem that we're confronted with, I think is more difficult. And that's difficult enough. The second problem is that China is different. Now there has been, there's a widespread assumption in the West that um, there's only one way of being modern. And the, the destination of every country ultimately is a Western style arrangements, democracy, and the rest of it. Um, and that, therefore, the process of modernization is essentially the process of westernization. Now, I think that this is wrong. Um, since the second half of the 20th century, starting in East Asia, moving across to South Asia, Latin America, and so on, we've seen, for the first time, apart from Japan, um, many countries in the world that are not a function and a product of Western history and culture taking the modernization road. And we are moving not only into a multipolar world, we're moving into a world of multiple modernities. And the most important expression of this is China. Its history and its culture are very different from that of the Western world. China has not been, is not, and will not be Western. But we need to understand this. And one of the great difficulties is that our conceptual tools for making sense of China are overwhelmingly a product of Western history and Western culture and Western intellectual study. And it can't make sense, in my view, of 
China. So the first part of the talk tonight, this evening, I want to talk about four building blocks I'll offer you to try and understand the difference that is China. Now the first is that, is that China her, is a nation state. But it's only been a nation state for 100 years, and everyone knows that China is much, much older than that. This map here is roughly the borders of the Qin Dynasty at the end of the Warring State period in 221 BC. And if you take it a few, not so long later, still at over 2,000 years ago, this is the Han Dynasty. And you can see already that it's assuming the borders of uh, eastern and central China where the vast majority of Chinese, for example, today live. Now, China, therefore, is only very, very recently a nation state and historically is really you know, a great civilization or what I would argue is a civilization state. And here we come to a really important point. What defines for, China, for the Chinese their sense of identity and how they conceive China is not a function of the period of being a nation state. It is a function of the civilization state period, that colossal period of 2,000 years. What am I thinking of here? Ideographic language, very special relationship between the state and society, very unusual relationship, distinctive family, Confucian values, huge commitment to the notion of the unity of the civilization, social customs like Guanxi, ancestral worship, Chinese food, um, uh, Chinese medicine, and so on. The di this is in contrast to the Western experience. The Western experience has been essentially that the notion of identity is defined essentially in terms of nation. It's a national identity. So here we come to a very important difference. China is a country, country constituted on the basis of civilization. Western countries are countries constituted fundamentally on the basis of nation. So I would describe China as primarily a civilization state for three reasons. The first reason is this one, the sheer longevity of China. Secondly, that unusually, and this is where, for example, it differs from India, um, for, uh, for 2,000 years, civilization, broadly speaking, has coincided with a polity, hence civilization state. China is the longest continuously existing polity in the world. And the third uh, diff uh, uh, reason is China's sheer demographic and uh, geographical uh, scale. Um, this is a, often underestimated, but a very, very diverse country with great uh, disparities. Um, those four provinces between them have a population larger than that of the United States. Those nine provinces there, each of them is as large or larger than the UK or, or France. Or the sheer disparities, I mean, this is an obvious one, GDP per head, but not Shanghai, the richest, Gansu, one of the poorest. I mean, this is, uh, whereas in, with India we recognize it, in China it's often underestimated. There is immense diversity. And therefore, the place can't be simply run from Beijing. It seems to be run from Beijing, but actually, if you know much about China, you know very well that, you know, for example, provincial governments or city governments have a great deal of authority. In fact, the bigger provincial governments have much uh, more power uh, than most uh, nation uh, states. Now, what does all this mean, uh, China being a civilization state? Can I quickly give you two examples? What's the great difference between Europe and China? Well, maybe the, uh, maybe the great difference is what happened uh, 2,000 years ago and the situation today. 2,000 years ago, Europe was united in the Holy Roman Empire. And then, uh, the subsequent 2,000 years, as you know, it broke up and then fragmented into lots of different uh, political units, and today we know Europe as many nation states. That's its default mode. China, over exactly the same period, went in exactly the opposite direction. It went from fragmentation to unity. But to hold a country of this scale together 
is hugely difficult. And uh, the Chinese historian Wang Gongwu has estimated that maybe for a third of Chinese history it's been in various forms of division and disunity and so on, often at great cost. So for the Chinese, the most important political value as a consequence of their history, bar none, I'm not talking about the government, I'm talking about the average Chinese, the psych if you like, the most important political value is unity. The unity of Chinese civilization is extremely important to the, to the Chinese. I mean, the reason why Mao is much more popular in China than Deng Xiaoping, despite everything one might have thought, is because Mao put the country together again, reunited it, um, expelled the foreign invaders, got rid of the colonial powers, and so on. Um, and for the Chinese, this nothing could have been uh, more important. The other example is Hong Kong. You remember the transfer of Hong Kong from Britain to China in 1997. And you may remember the constitutional formula the Chinese proposed, which was one country, two systems. And I would wager that hardly anyone believed the Chinese, certainly my own country, that they meant it. They thought, oh, when China gets its hands on uh, Hong Kong, it'll soon be like the rest of China. Actually, this was completely wrong. Fifteen years later, politically and legally, which is at the heart of this matter, Hong Kong is at least as different as it was uh, in, in 1997. We got it wrong. Why did we get it wrong? Well, we got it wrong because we think in nation-state terms. We think uh, that, uh, I'll give you a classic example of this, that um, uh, German unification uh, after 1989 uh, we think one nation equals one system. And so in the unification of Germany, West, uh, East Germany disappeared and West Germany became, in effect, the new unified Germany. And this was a perfectly logical way of thinking for a nation state. That's what nation states do. One, one, one country, or one nation, one nation state, uh, one system. But China is not primarily a nation state. It is primarily a civilization state. And it, as I said, impossible to run um, a country of this scale without actually a lot of systemic differences across the country, and there still are in all sorts of ways, uh, that is the case. So for a civilization state, one state, one country, two systems is a perfectly logical way of thinking, which is when so Deng Xiaoping, when he proposed it, it came out of Chinese uh, uh, history. So here we have very important difference in the Chinese conception of sovereignty and a nation-state conception of sovereignty. For the Chinese, what matters in the, in the case of sovereignty is not to have the same system, but to the acceptance of the sovereignty of, in this case, you know, the government in Beijing. Um, but for a nation-state, it has a, a, a much greater meaning, which is uh, one nation, uh, one system. So what I would argue, actually, is that this is a profound implication, uh, that with Ch rise, China's rise, uh, this, the logic of being a civilization state, the thought process involved in it, the historical meanings that are associated with it, will have profound ramifications for not just China, I think, but the world. Um, my second point is, is uh, my second building block, moving on from the civilization state, is the tributary system. Now, we are all intrigued, puzzled, maybe nervous, about how China will behave when it becomes, as Vinod puts it, a global power. My book is really not about uh, China ruling the world, because I don't think any countries ever rule the world or ever will. It's what will the world be like when China is a hegemonic power and the most influential and powerful country in the world. Now, you often, I often see, for example, in the relationship between China and Africa, uh, people, um, loose-thinking journalists saying, you know, the new colonialism. Actually, apart from perhaps the expansion of the Qing dynasty westwards uh, in, from the mid-17th century, China's never gone in for colonialism, certainly not overseas colonialism. It could have colonized Southeast Asia, for example, easily in the early period, the early 15th century during the Ming dynasty and so on, but it didn't. No, China went down a road very different from the Europeans. China went down the road of the tributary system lasted for a very long time, thousands of years, certainly since the Han Dynasty. And the tributary system was essentially uh, occupying 
um, uh, embraced China, the Korean Peninsula, varied over time, Japan, Taiwan, parts of the Philippines, uh, Java, Indochina, and so on. It was a profoundly China-centric system. China dominated the region because economically it was much more advanced and also politically and culturally, of course, with Confucius and, and, and people like this. And writing systems in some countries were derived from the Chinese system. The state system was derived in several countries from the Chinese system and so on. Basically, how did it work? Well, it was a symbolic system, a culturally symbolic system, where the rulers of the tribute states um, offered tribute to the emperor in return for access uh, to markets and forms of protection. Um, but the one requirement persistently as a thread through the tributary system was that um, was the acceptance of, culture, of, of China's superiority. This was extremely important to the Chinese and I'm sure it will ring a bell uh, uh, in your minds as well, in a more contemporary way. Now, this system came to an end in 1900 with the growing enfeeblement of the Qing, of Qing's China, and also the arrival on the back of industrialization of British and French colonialism, followed uh, right behind by Japanese colonialism. Now, let's fast forward to the present and how this region is being reconfigured. The, this is the proportion of exports going to China as a proportion of countries' total exports. This blue line is in 1995. If I took you back further, it would be much lower. And the green line is 2010. And what this shows us in trade terms, but it's also true in terms of capital movements and in terms of slowly, a bit behind, but in terms of the use of the RMB and so on, which is just developing um, since 2008, you can see the rise of China's importance for all the countries in the region in terms of an export market. In fact, for these countries, China is now the most important export market. They are Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Malaysia, North Indonesia, not sure about the Philippines, and Japan. I mean, a roughly a quarter of all exports from this region now go uh, to uh, China. In other words, there's a profound restructuring taking place uh, of the regional economy, once more, in a sense, returning it more to the state of affairs that existed during the tributary uh, system. Now, of course, it works differently for different countries uh, because they come to the relationship with China in different ways. I mean, Japan, of course, is very fearful of the rise of China because of what it did in the period between 1930 and 1945. Um, Korea is a different sort of example. It's often cited as the classic tributary state. And uh, although in the present, uh, with the present president's been quite hostile to China and very pro-American, the two presidents before that, opened up very new course for South Korea and it moved much closer to China. Taiwan is, the, is a staggering example, actually, uh, of the way in which a country uh, has moved much closer to China and I think ultimately will actually accept Chinese sovereignty in the manner of Hong Kong. The Southeast Asian countries are, of course, different. They're further away and so on, and, um, but they're being drawn in different ways closer to China. But the most Remarkable example of this is what's called is in what's called the Greater Mekong subregion, where there are five countries plus two Chinese provinces. They are Myanmar, if I can remember them, Myanmar, Thailand, um, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And if you want to see how Chinese development is spilling over into its immediate bordering countries, this is the classic example in terms of trade, in terms of the use of the renminbi, which is now widespread in Cambodia, for example, in terms of Chinese investment, in terms of the presence of Chinese banks, in terms of uh, patterns of economic integration, for example, the spread of a high-speed rail network, in terms of um, roads, and also in terms of Myanmar in particular, of course, in terms of oil pipelines and so on. And so we witness a profound change taking place
uh, in, in, uh, in, in this area in particular, but it actually is characteristic of a much wider pattern, but less developed, less intense so far in the whole, actually, uh, of uh, East uh, Asia. Now, uh, what uh, conclusions uh, should uh, we draw? Uh, uh, should we draw from this? Um, I mean, let me just take two examples. One is American influence and presence in the region and the pivot. And secondly, uh, what China is likely to be like as a global power. As you know, under Obama, uh, America and Hillary Clinton, uh, the Americans have tried to make up for that period lost uh, under Bush. And uh, they've got a sort of three-pronged strategy, really. Uh, one is uh, new weapon systems to try and roll back the Chinese. I mean, China is not always named, but China is clearly what this is all about. Secondly, intensification of the alliances, extension and consolidation, particularly with um, Japan and South Korea, but not only them. And thirdly, on the trade front, the so-called Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership. I think that the American difficulty here is not in the short term, because in the short term that's possible, but it's in the medium term. Because the United States is a far weaker power economically in this region than it used to be. I mean, the major export market for decades in the post-war period for East Asian countries was the United States. I can't think of a country, maybe well, not even Indonesia now, if I remember correctly, where the United States is still the major market. The, the danger for the Americans is that their presence in the region will essentially be a security hard power aircraft carrier, aircraft carrier born uh, uh, presence. And in the long run, I don't think that's particularly sustainable geopolitical position because uh, who are you going to choose if you're one of these countries in the, this region? Uh, a, a faraway power with, an air, with, a, with a big military competence or are you going to choose you know, easily, hugely, your biggest, biggest trading partner? So I think we need to think of this also in more strategic terms. The other point I want to make quickly is that, well, what's China going to be like as a power? I don't think it's going to be a replica of the United States and, for example, before that, the UK. I mean, there are going to be some similarities, of course, but I don't think it's going to be a replica. And the reason I don't think it's going to be a replica is because the Chinese, um, historically, have never tried to be a maritime power projecting militarily its authority around the world. Sure, it might do a bit of it, but it's quite different from the European or the American experience. I think that the archetypal form of Chinese power, when its you know, global presence is much greater than it is now, will be actually cultural. A sen this sense, which I've mentioned once or twice already, this sense of cultural superiority. Now, the third building block I want to mention concerns um, race. China has 1.3 billion people, but not everyone is aware that over 90% of the population believe themselves to be of one race. Now this is most unusual. If you compare it with the other four most populous countries in the world, India, the United States, um, Indonesia and Brazil, all of them regard themselves to be in varying degrees multiracial and multicultural. Now you can argue, of course, well, yeah, obviously China had multiple races across its landmass historically, and that is clearly true. But the important question for us is, why do the Chinese think like this? Why do they, over 90%, think they are of the same race? And so this is, a, in my view, an extremely important question. Um, and I think there are essentially, uh, taking this map here, there are two processes that took part place in this eastern part of China. And you can't understand this without remembering civilization state 2,000 years old. Two twin processes. One, a long process of occupation, annexation, civil war between lots of different states, absorption, assimilation, ethnic cleansing, government resettlement, 
to the point where the sort of sense of physical difference between the different races gradually became less and less important compared with what they felt they had in common. And the other process alongside that, because race is not essentially a biological concept, it's a cultural concept, alongside that was a growing sense of Chinese cultural identity. Remember, China, with the Fertile Crescent 12,000 years ago, or roughly that, had, was home to the first settled agriculture in the world, the first sort of early complex societies, the first central star, sort of centralized authorities, governments, and so on. And then, two and a half, you know, going down through history, two and a half thousand years ago, same time as the Greek philosophers, Confucius writing in a very, very sophisticated way, the most sophisticated at the time, about political, about governments, requirements of leadership, moral authority, and so on. And then into the more modern period of the last 2,000 years, you know, as you know, China's had some remarkable periods. The Tang Dynasty, perhaps the most inventive of all, the Sung Dynasty in the 11th, 12th, early 13th century, the, the, and, and then uh, the Ming and the um, uh, and even parts of the Qing dynasty. This process over such a long historical period gave the Chinese a great sense of cultural identity, or I'll call it ethnic cultural identity, a great sense of a cultural achievement, and actually a profound sense of cultural uh, superiority. Now, what conclusions can we draw from this? Well, the first conclusion I'd say is what the great advantage of this was that actually it would have been impossible to, ha to, ha to keep a landmass together like this as a single polity without the cement of this ethnic identity, this overwhelming ethnic identity. It just couldn't have happened. The disadvantage is that this process of ethnic construction, which distinguishes China, as every country has this own process, um, resulted, I think, in the Han historically having a weak conception of difference, a weak ability to recognize cultural difference, a weak ability to respect cultural difference. And you can see this in the attitudes of the Han, I think, to this day uh, in Tibet, towards the Tibetans uh, and towards uh, the Uyghur. And if you ask me, well, what is my, personally, my greatest worry about the rise of China, it would be as a great global power, will China develop an understanding of the differences, if you like, of other peoples and other countries? Oh, you know, India is a classic example. Uh, Africa, of course, is another. Um, my third point, um, my fourth point, sorry, so that's, that's civilization state one, tributary system two, race three, is about the state. And I think I'm going to uh, tread on some on the toes of existing orthodoxies in what I'm going to argue. It is generally uh, believed, certainly in the West, that the legitimacy and authority of a state, of the governing institutions of a society, is a function of democracy. Now, I'll accept that it is a factor, but it's only one element. It can be very important or it can be not so important. I mean, take Italy. Italy has had, more hot dinner, has had more elections than I've ever had hot dinners. It's always voting. And yet the, the common feature of Italy as the thread running through the whole of the post-war period and earlier is that actually the state suffers from a chronic lack of legitimacy. That's why they'll elect someone like Berlusconi. No, because actually a lot of Italians don't believe in paying taxes. Um, that a lot of Italians think what you can get away with, you should get away with. Another half, by and large, will go along with, with, with it. And the reason for this is because the Risorgimento, the unification of Italy, was only half successful. It, the country, the state, lacks legitimacy despite democracy. Now, I would suggest to you that actually the Chinese state enjoys a remarkable degree of legitimacy and authority amongst in the eyes of the Chinese. In fact, I would go further. I'd say more than in any Western state. And clearly, the reason is not democracy, because in our terms, it doesn't have any democracy. So how do we explain this? 
I think we explain it in very Chinese terms. You know, the state is seen by the people, by the Chinese people, as the defender, the guardian, the protector, the embodiment, the expression of Chinese civilization. And in Chinese terms, as I tried to explain earlier, this is as close as the Chinese, who are not a very religious people, very superstitious, but not very religious, as close as they get to a sort of spiritual sense, if you like. The state is seen as embodying what the country is. This is so different, of course, from Western countries because uh, you know we don't, we're not civilization states. We don't have this relationship to civilization, uh, and so on. Now, uh, the um, uh, the way in which uh, well, let me just show you very quickly some um, uh, an illustration of this. This is this uh, table I'm about to come to in a moment is by Tony Sage from the Kenny School at Harvard, and it's levels of satisfaction uh, with government in China. The, the left-hand line is central government, and then you go, sort of get, as you get more local, they get less popular, they get less satisfied. Um, but these are remarkable levels of satisfaction. They must give us all pause for thought, I think. They're much higher than anything you could recall, uh, record uh, in any Western country. Now, it's clear in the eyes of the Chinese, you know, that uh, they see the state completely differently from the way we view it in the West. Uh, in the West, as you know, um, people uh, view, wherever they are on the political spectrum, they have a view that there are certain things the state should do, maybe, and there are lots of things it shouldn't do, and its powers need to be defined, codified, and constrained. And if you're on the right, in the Tea Party, you'll think even worse. You know, you'll think it's the devil incarnate, and if you're a social democrat, you'll be more benign. Now, the Chinese don't view the state like this at all. Totally different paradigm. For the Chinese, it's not a question of is the state an alien, an enemy, a stranger, or what have you. For the Chinese, the state is viewed as an intimate. Not any old intimate, but actually like a member of the family. Not even any old member of the family, but the head of the family. So this is so different um, from uh, uh, the experience, certainly in the West, uh, as to be um, quite extraordinary. And often people probably here as well view the Chinese state as an Achilles, the keel, Achilles heel of Chinese development. Uh, I beg to differ. I beg to differ. I think that the state, the Chinese state is a remarkable institution um, and it will come to exercise, I think, certainly in the developing world, but I think in the longer run in the West as well, considerable influence over the way in which uh, we think. It, it is a new paradigm, but I won't go into the details of that now. So there, those are my four points. Now, very quickly, to uh, finish with, I want to say something about the present. Um, where are we now? Where has China got to? Well, <clears throat> uh, I finished the book in late 2008, just at the time of, more or less the time of the financial crisis. And I remember um, in the early meetings I did in 2009 saying, um, making a talk, and, and, and lots of talks, and people would, have, someone would very get up and say, well, you know, it's, it's all very well to talk like this, but um, actually China, the Chinese growth is unsustainable, there'll be an economic crisis, there'll be a political crisis, which leads to an economic crisis, and so on. And this was the standard uh, a strong, strong standard view. Not everyone heard it, but so, a fair number of people thought like this. Well, actually, they were right. There was a crisis. There was a huge crisis. But it didn't take place in China. It took place in the United States. In the Goldman Sachs figures, uh, which are widely quoted for, produced in 2007, it was projected that the Chinese economy would overtake the American economy in size, just in size in um, 2027, um, the latest projection, um, oh, sorry, I, uh, th th that, that's what's happened to the Western economies in the period since the financial crisis. Most of them are still smaller than they were, and that's Chinese growth. And the consequence of all that is this, that it's now anticipated that rather than being 2027, uh, the Chinese economy will overtake the American economy in size. That's only one measure but in size in 2018. 
And I think that actually we'll look back on 2008 as a turning point in the rise of China and its relationship to the global economy. I would argue that probably China is now a bigger shaper architect of globalization and the nature of the global economy than the United States. And there are essentially four reasons for this. One, China is an enormous uh, trader. Uh, there's another one, but I don't want to use that now. Uh, an enormous trader, one, because it, you know, it's, it imports enormous quantities of raw materials. Uh, you know, nearly half of the world's iron or zinc and so on. And also because it is an incredible exporter, the biggest in the world, overtaking the United States in 2003. And um, rushing along here, this is the proportion of trade done by different countries with China. And all the green lines are those countries in the world with which China is now, for whom China is now the biggest trading partner in terms of exports and imports, that is. So Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Venezuela, United States, uh, Russia, Pakistan, India, uh, South Africa, uh, Egypt, um, and then of course all the East Asian countries there, uh, Japan and so on, plus Australia um, at the bottom. Secondly, China has become, because it saves a lot, because it runs a big balance of payments deficit, because, oh, surplus, sorry, because of uh, the government's own surplus, has become, in a world of indebtedness as far as the West is concerned, a real financial power. And this is a remarkable fact, isn't it? That two Chinese institutions, the China Development Bank and the China Export Import Bank, in 2009 and 2010, lent more to the developing world than the World Bank. And the third thing that's happening, started late 2008, is the growing use of the renminbi as a result of the decision of the Chinese government uh, for the payment of trade. And HSBC has estimated that half of China's trade um, by between 2013 and 2015 will be paid for uh, in, in the RMB, which is about, of course, the decline of the dollar because the dollar is now the predominant form of payment in this uh, trade. And the fourth uh, example is just a symbolic one, but you remember in the end of October, uh, one of those last year, one of those serial euro summits to save uh, European summits to save the euro. And at the end of it, um, President Sarkozy, as he was then, got on the phone to Hu Jintao and said, you know, we need a huge loan from China to bail out the euro. Well, the Chinese, um, of course, decided not to wisely because they've never got the money back. Um, but, what, <laughs> but what an extraordinary thing to happen. I mean, you know, quite frankly, the European population still looked down on the Chinese as poor, and you know, no democracy, no human rights, and all the rest of it. And here we were suddenly going cap in hand to the Chinese to rescue us. You know. It happened once before for Europe at the end of the Second World War, martial aid. But, but that was from the United States. But of course, America is now more indebted, actually, uh, than Europe is. So we are moving into what I call, with these four facts I've been talking about, trade, uh, China's financial power, um, the RMB and this symbolic example I've just been giving you to what I call the very beginnings of a Chinese economic order if you like global order just the very very beginnings of it um, but one can feel it now the final point I want to make is this that it's not true uh, that this is the only trend of our time of course it's not there are two trends in our time one is the rise of China, and the other is the rise of the developing world, where 85% of the world's population lives. There's been a great shift uh, taking place over the last few decades from the developed world to the developing world. Mid-1970s, develop, developing world, only one-third of the world's GDP. Turn of the century, 50-50. Around 2020, 2025, it'll be more like two-thirds. So we have a, a double trend, the rise of the developing world and the rise of China. The rise of China is part of the developing world. The relationship between the two, China is going to be predominant 
in the developing world for a long time to come. And um, it will uh, exercise, I think, uh, a degree of hegemony uh, over um, uh, the developing world. But I think that the new world order time will be highly influenced and shaped by China. But its base will not simply be the developed world. It will be increasingly develop, the, the developing world. So you can see this already in common cause in areas like, for example, the IMF and the World Bank. The pressure for new uh, global institutions which reflect the new configuration of global power. What will happen? Well, I think what will happen is there will be a reform in the IMF and the World Bank, but probably a bit too slow, and that we'll see new institutions arising. So, for example, maybe there will be a BRICS bank. I don't know. But that was proposed at the last BRICS summit, and if it happened and it had any effectuality at all, it would be much, much larger than the World Bank. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. Um, so you have now a pretty good idea what this uh, formidable uh, book is uh, all about. Um, we have, of course, uh, you know, amongst uh, uh, China observers, a very wide spectrum from uh, what I might call roughly the Gordon Chang school of coming collapse of China, all the way to those uh, who would uh, have a, a much more, shall we say, optimistic seen from Chinese perspective view of where uh, China will be. Um, I think um, um, just highlighting some of the main points which have come through, I think, of course, uh, Martin begins by reminding us that uh, modernization uh, is not necessarily just westernization and how China is uh, different um, civilizational state. Uh, of course, the political scientists may argue um, whether there is such a sharp distinction between a civilizational state and a nation state concept, maybe lots of gray areas in between, but there it is. Then um, the tributary system as a historical thing and where it leads to, uh, the one might once again argue, but this is for debate in the interactive session, uh, Martin's assumption that China could very easily have in fact been a colonial power if it had so wished. Uh, I'm not quite sure, sure. speaking exclusively from um, uh, two countries, whether it's Vietnam and Indonesia, I think China did make several attempts and not very successful as far as China is concerned. Chung He did move towards uh, Indonesia. Um, and the, I, it will never be very clear what his exact objectives were, but certainly did not do all that well. And as far as the cultural impact of uh, China on Southeast Asia, I'm just returning from one more of these conferences about you know, civilizational dialogue between India and Southeast Asia. It's well known that for a very large part of Southeast Asia, whether we're talking of Indonesia, um, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, uh, historically, uh, Chinese cultural impact was rather uh, marginal. You have to go further up uh, East Asia and North Vietnam for this to happen. But once again, these could be issues on which we could, con th th I don't think that affects the, some of the basics. Then of course, the question, the role of race uh, and the unity factor, very important factors. And you know, we, I think we have to um, sort of, uh, I think the very important points which uh, Martin is making there, um, uh, and of course it's uh, this question, very interesting uh, point about um, uh, the issue of legitimacy as to where the Chinese state draws its legitimacy uh, from, and uh, you know, not, uh, it's not really necessary to get obsessed with this Western democracy as the, this. Though once again, people may argue what was Tiananmen all about. Um, on his way, are we now? I think basically what we have is, I think, a very sound statement uh, from uh, Martin about this absolutely exponential, uh, rapid uh, economic growth of China and issues which he raises as to what, in what way, this will impact China's foreign policy. Uh, um, and, and this happening at the same time, of course, it's all, in a sense, you might say they're two sides of the same coin, the rise of China and the relative decline of the United States. 
So a whole new world, a whole new challenges, and that's what this interactive session is going to be about, gentlemen. I'm now about to throw open this discussion for the next four to five minutes. Please identify yourself. I'm not going to say only a question. You're welcome to make comments, but rather brief ones. Thank you, gentlemen. Your. I'm Vinish Sharma. My basic question is that that uh, there is possibility. Okay. Okay. I'm Vinish Sharma. My basic question is that uh, is there any possibility of a crash? You know that that we saw in 1997, or for that matter, even with Russia. You know because uh, both uh, the analogies are similar. Because Russia was also coming up very, I mean, uh, very uh, sharply at that point of time. Russia. Will there be the same kind of crash? So speak slow, relax. Don't hurry. I'll give you the time. Okay. Go on. At the time of, in 1991, Russia was also going up very uh, sharply like China, but uh, it had to face, I mean, this op uh, opposition from within because of its own growth, uh, because of, due, due to democracy and all. In 1997, same thing happened with Indonesia, uh, where, uh, when the, the other crash happened. So is there a possibility that China would, would also uh, face the same situation because uh, in future, you know, this uh, economic uncertainty is only going to rise. Plus, that the, as far as the econ economic rise is concerned, it is only because of outsourcing, outsourcing of manufacturing products that the, uh, China is producing, for example, computer chips and all. And secondly, it has uh, got tensions within from Taiwan as well as from Tibet. So, what are the? Uh, so, how do you view, view these? Uh... Good. Well, I think I will. T we'll take about three questions at a time. Is that all right? Yeah. Yes. Please. Just one brief comment first, that uh, given the fact that the United States is now uh, discovering a lot of energy and is likely to be self-sufficient in energy within the next 10 years, uh, certain trends in technology, uh, additive manufacturing, which appear to challenge the growth of international trade and uh, at the moment appear to trend, be a trend towards localization in, in, and reindustrialization of places. and. The emphasis the U.S. Uh, defense industry is now putting on propulsion and uh, propulsion fuels and uh, methods to counter DF-10 and DF-21, though ostensibly it is to cut down the Pentagon's fuel, fuel bill. And the revolution taking place in electricals, uh, starting with the defense industry, but which will at some point be translated into uh, chill angles in the United States. It may be just a little bit too early, and demographics, they will have a growing thanks to immigration population and gray less fast and less uh, and less overall than Europe. Uh, it may be too soon to uh, write them off. But the question is, given the uncertain economic environment, slowdown in international trade, and the fact that many countries may no longer be happy to sustain a position of supplying raw materials to China indefinitely and, imp and, and importing finished goods, will China succeed in being able to uh, increase consumption and shift from an export-led model, which has been successful, to a domestic consumption-led model. Uh, that's the first question. The second is, what would be the political impact if it did not? At one point of time, speaking to a senior Chinese interlocutor in 2005 from their central bank, and they had just started to uh, allow the RMB to float just a little bit in a limited manner. Uh, there had been a lot of speculation about how the value the currency movements would change. And I was told point blank to my face by the senior uh, Chinese central bank figure that it will take many, many years. It will be very, very slow. It will appreciate, but very, very slowly, because 80% of all new jobs in China since 1983, according to him, were created by exports. And, uh, uh, and China could not afford to. Uh, and, and therefore, export-led growth was critical to political stability in China. Thank you. Please. Okay, 
Right, I have an interesting range of questions. All yours. Your mic is for now. Okay. Well, um, on your question, um, I think uh, although we think of them in rather similar ways, because you know we classify them both for obvious reasons as communist regimes, um, actually the examples of China and the Soviet Union, as we used to know it, are profoundly different. I mean, it's not true that the Soviet Union was doing well in 1991 when it disintegrated. On the contrary, um, from the 1960s, the Soviet Union's economic performance was actually in relative decline for a variety of reasons. And it, and it was a, a relatively, you know, it was a system that could, wasn't reformed. Um, and right at the end, Gorbachev tried to reform it, and he probably reformed it in the wrong way, actually. Um, and it was this, you know, it was the failure of the Soviet Union as a political and economic project that led to its disintegration. Now, China's a very, very different example. China, uh, you know, I mean, even during the Mao period, it was growing, but modestly, you know, five and a half percent, something like that. And then Deng Xiaoping came to power in uh, the late 70s and took China, uh, China in a very different direction. Um, and that was a remarkable thing, really, when you, if, you, if you look back on it. Um, and I think that the reason that the Chinese Communist Party could do this is because unlike, unlike the Soviet Communist Party, it had deep roots amongst the Chinese. I mean, the difficulty with the Soviet Communist Party was that essentially the Bolsheviks' support was in the cities, and very few people lived in the cities. So it always had a problem with the countryside. And so, you know, collectivization was forced collectivization. You know, many, many of the richer farmers were bumped off and so on. You know. Whereas in China, it was the opposite. The Chinese support, of the Communist Party's support, Mao's support, was in the countryside, not in the cities. The Guomintang had the support in the cities. So it enjoyed reserves of support, the Chinese Revolution, which the, the Soviet, Soviet uh, uh, Communist Party never did. Yeah? So this is absolutely, it seems to be crucial to the difference. And so it also gave a great sense of confidence to the Chinese. I mean, I interpret Deng Xiaoping and what happened then as the act of an extremely confident organization. I mean, even when it was in trouble, it was in trouble. I'm not saying it was about to be overthrown, but it was in trouble then. But it actually went for, you know, and in that situation, it had the confidence to do something new. So I think the, the examples are completely different. And um, uh, I mean, the Soviet Union never had a period like this period of Chinese growth, never. Um, so I, 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 I don't think the parallels are, uh, uh, exist. Um, on the, um, the the other point I want to make is is because I've had this in other uh, d discussions I've been involved with, that is a sort of underestimation actually of the um, of the strength of Chinese economic growth and its transformation. Um, you know, I, I, someone said to me, oh, uh, yesterday uh, was it at the IIC when I gave a talk at the IIC. Um, um, Someone said, well, um, you know, half of Chinese exports um, are uh, sourced by foreign firms operating within China, um, which is true. Um, but it, it, as if, well, it must be all, you know, it's the work of, foreign, of foreigners, basically. Now, it, it, this, there's no question, this has been, inward investment has been very important for the Chinese. Actually, not so much Western investment, but actually from overseas Chinese has been even more important. But you've got to take a picture of the Chinese economy as a video, not as a as a as a as a, uh, a snapshot. And if you look at the way the Chinese economy is evolving, if you know anything about the Yangtze Delta, for example, or Guangdong Province, you can see the very rapid 
upgrading of Chinese production in the more advanced regions. And there are now quite a few firms who are either competitive with Western firms or are nearly competitive with Western firms. So I think that um, you know, China's come a long way uh, from where it was. Um, and, but the big question, and this is your question, is um, can, it, can it make the next step, really? You know, can it move from being predominantly a, a labor-intensive, export-orientated economy um, based on relatively cheap labor? Um, um, right. We, yeah. uh, well, on your... We begin with... Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, all, uh, well, I didn't quite get your third point, but the first two points are true. Uh, it, it, it's certainly true uh, that, um, uh, well, not just regional disparities, but all sorts of disparities have been on the increase in China. Now, it's certainly true that in a process of uh, modernization, industrialization, this tends to be the case. The worst the problem, the biggest problem, and this has been true ever since the British Industrial Revolution, is that the gap between the countryside, agrarian, those who work in the countryside and those who live in the cities grows bigger and bigger. And um, no one's found a good way around this problem. Um, but it's certainly a, a very important part of what's happening in China. And it's perceived to be uh, uh, um, a problem. And many people resent it. And, and, the, and the inequalities, you know, I mean, it's not just a, I mean, there's, there's multiple inequalities. There's, there's the inequality that I mentioned between the, the, the urban and the rural. There's the inequality between different regions of China, between those who have historically been rich, like the Yangtze Delta and the eastern China and the, interior, uh, the central uh, parts of China. And then in the cities, if you go to Beijing, you can see some people are very rich. You know, I mean, um, um, fancy cars are much more common in Beijing uh, than they are in, uh, in Delhi. So uh, I, think, I, think, I think you're right. The question really is, you know, where, is, where are these problems going to go? Can the, the giant, could, could they, um, in effect, um, uh, undermine the process of transformation? Could they become uh, so difficult that, they, uh, that, that chi China becomes more and more difficult to govern? Could they lead to very serious social conflicts and so on? And I think the answer to that is, uh, uh, is yes. I think they could do under certain circumstances. Um, uh, it all depends, you know, on how they get, you know, how they get along. Um, and so nothing is certain. You know, I'm, I'm relatively, I'm relatively uh, optimistic, but I accept immediately that there are other way, other, other, you know, it's much too complicated to just have sort of simplistic um, uh, um, answers about what the future holds. Um, uh, likewise, you know, your point about will the transformation continue? I mean, I think it will. I, thi I think it's still got a lot of legs, put it like this. I mean, let me tell you what I think. I think that, uh, firstly, even the basic grunt transformation, you know, has still got quite a lot left in it that we were talking about. Because half the population still lives in the countryside. So over the next 20 years, you're going to see a huge shift still taking place into the cities. So, you know, that, well, that will give it a basic growth rate. Also, I actually think one of the really things, striking things about China is wherever you go, you see transformation. I mean, it's not just in Shanghai and Beijing and Guangzhou and so on. It is, you know, I, 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 I've been visiting interior provinces and every city is, you know, is, is being transformed or has been transformed and so on. So I agree with those who've argued actually there's a lot of momentum, there's a lot of traction in China's development. So I think it will carry on for a period. But if they don't ref manage to reform in good time and so on, uh, then it could, you know, the growth rate could slow rather more than they think. I mean, Yu Yongding, my friend I was telling you about earlier, I mean, he says the danger, you know, they've got this problem with the West now the Western markets. So therefore, what they're introducing is another stimulus package, you know, because uh, to boost the growth rate and so on. The danger, he says, is that in 10 years' time, you know, it'll be much more difficult to make this shift if they haven't done it now, and the consequences could be more serious. Yeah? Um, how will the Chinese government handle the question of Tibet? Uh, hopefully differently in the future from the past. Um, 
I mean, I think the greatest failure of Chinese policy uh, since 1949 has been in the handling of uh, Xinjiang and Tibet. And, um, you know, they, they I, I don't completely understand why uh, the Chinese approach has been like it is. Because actually, looking at the Chinese, you know, historically, and the way in which they've handled difference has been complicated. I mean, you've had the kind of, the Confucian approach has generally been um, a very expansionist approach. You know, we will draw you into us. Um, but there's another approach which has been, you are different and therefore we do not accept you. And um, although they pursued the first approach in some ways with Tibet and Xinjiang, they've, they, they deny both the Uyghur and the Tibetans their cultural identity, their religious practices, and so on. And um, I mean, there have been moments, you know, Hu Yabang, uh, several decades ago, said to the Dalai Lama at the time, uh, you know, we, 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 we've done it wrong. Uh, Hu Yabang was prepared general secretary under Deng Xiaoping. And, uh, and we think that we should, have we, sh we should have pursued a different approach. We should have given you more autonomy, more freedoms, and so on, and we're going to change it. But Hu Yabang's position lost within the Chinese leadership at the time, and this has not happened. So, um, so I don't know. I, I, I'm told that, that I'm, I, I, I was told that their policy was going to shift, but it's not shifted, and I don't see much sign of it shifting. Um, um, so... Uh, so I'm not very optimistic about this, but I'd like to be, but I'm, I'm not. Um, what do, uh, oh, um, China, does it, does not have colonial objectives? I mean, I am use colonize in a very specific way, you know, which is direct political rule, what Britain did to you, especially after 1857. Um, and, uh, so America has not been a colonizer, except in certain instances, like the Philippines and so on. But um, it has, as we know, had a regime by which it's exercised hegemony over the whole world, especially since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, I think the rise of China, the Chinese will have their ways of exercising hegemony over other countries. Now, there's a, there's a very interesting book book I'd like, I know some very distinguished people here are very interesting at all these kind of things. Can I recommend a book to you by uh, a leading Chinese international relations scholar called Yan Xu Tong, who is the director of um, the Institute of Modern International Relations at Tsinghua University. And the book is called, if I remember correctly, Ancient Chinese Thought, Modern Chinese Power. And it relates to your question about what's going to happen to Chinese foreign policy. And the fascinating thing is that he, he uh, th this, is a, this is a very ambitious, well, well, you know, one of the characteristics of Chinese culture um, is that uh, history is hugely relevant to the present in a way I think is not true in any other country. Um, so any debate in China is often peppered with um, quotes and the citing of old sages, not from 300 years ago or 500 years ago, but more like 2,000 years ago. And he, um, and, and actually Yan Xu Tong's book is exactly this tradition. You know, he looks at Confucius, he looks at Men, he looks at uh, Sun Ji, and uh, about eight different uh, thinkers. And the fascinating thing is, actually, I was convinced having read the book, he was right. <laughs> it does actually tell you quite a lot about the choices that China uh, faces uh, now. And his argument, this is interesting, his argument is that um, the era of Britain and European domination until 1945 was the age of tyranny because it was completely arbitrary, there were no treaties, you seized territory if you had the force, the might and so on. Then he describes the period from 45 to the present, the Cold War and then post-Cold War, the same thing he says is the age of hegemony where you know, you, your treatment of your allies has a certain sort of morality and your treatment um, of your enemies is duplicitous uh, and uh, unscrupulous. And he said that, because the Chinese have a different view about hegemony, a notion of hegemony, he's a gay, they're generally very critical of hegemony. And he says that the Chinese, that China in the long run should aspire to be to humane authority. In other words, to rule 
to, 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 to in excise influence over the world by moral virtue and not by hegemony. And I, this is a very interesting book. I do, I do recommend it. Um, now, when, where he agrees with, um, the, on the foreign policy question, the, the difficulty the Chinese, I think, have got now is that um, the foreign policy they've had uh, hitherto is essentially, as you said, uh, Binod, is, is Deng Xiaoping's. Uh, foreign policy, in his eyes, was the servant of domestic um, objectives, which were economic growth and the reduction of poverty. Um, but clearly China's in a different place now from where it was with Deng Xiaoping, because uh, it's still poor, but it's not, not weak anymore. It's strong. What's more, it's got a range of global interests. And one of the difficulties the Chinese face, I think, is that they, they don't really have a foreign policy now for this situation. Um, so I think they will move beyond it, but they'll move beyond it with great caution because it's been a very successful foreign policy for them because it's created the conditions for uh, the country's um, transformation. Um, and I also think there's another reason, and that is China's rise creates concern and can easily create fear. So. Uh, I mean, the Deng Xiaoping policy was, you know, hide your capability, don't show leadership, you know, proceed with great caution and so on. And I think this is as valuable now as it was before for the Chinese. So I would think that would be a line of continuity. But there is an absolutely fascinating, I mean, I was at, um, a visiting professor at Tsinghua University in the autumn, and there's a fascinating debate now in Beijing about the future of foreign policy. In fact, you know, people who think there's no discussion in China, Ah, oh, it's throbbing with the most extraordinarily interesting discussion for two reasons. One, if you are growing at 10% or 9% or 8% a year, it doesn't matter, uh, a year, then constantly you're thrown up new problems. And it's no use just waffling on about them. What you decide, how you discuss it and what you conclude decides on what you do. And that's what made, has made China, I think, a very interesting and very dynamic place. Coupled with the fact that now China is, a, is a, such a formidable has an increasingly formidable global presence, means that what China decides tomorrow is not, doesn't just affect China, it affects the world. So this is an, and I, when I got, got back from Beijing, you know, my brain sort of bursting, um, and I got back to London, and I had to reflect on the fact that there I was in China, you know, reputedly uh, a sort of rather homogeneous, monolithic uh, entity um, with no serious debate and discussion and certainly no democracy, and there it was, you know, absolutely fascinating, uh, hugely stimulating. And I got back to London, which has all the trappings of democracy and no discussion because no one's got anything new to say. Um, because, you know, we're just rehearsing our old positions, and I just thought, you know, how paradoxical, what an irony. Uh, 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 um, now, uh, I haven't quite finished, have I? Um, your points about uh, China ruling the world. I mean, I, I sort of, um, uh, as you can see, I'm not really talking about China ruling the world, but the point you, you make are very pertinent. If China is going to exercise, what should we say, I'm going to use the word hegemony, uh, uh, hegemonic influence on the world, it's not, it can't just be economics. It can't just be growth. It has to be multifaceted. And the truth is China's not in a position to do that. Because for the most part, it's not thought about these questions because it's more or less suddenly arrived in this situation. I mean, how long did it take the United States to develop that kind of capacity? I mean, I, wh what I do agree with is Paul Kennedy's argument in uh, Rise and Fall of Great Nations, which is that, you know, economic strength is a precondition for the exercise of political and military and ideological and moral influence. That, I think, is true. So. If you start getting it, you have the possibility of doing these things. If you start losing it, you're no longer able to exercise it. That's what's happened to Britain, and I think America's influence is also contracting, uh, uh, in some ways, quite, quite rapidly, in others not so rapidly. Now, can China develop this capability? I think it probably can, but we'll see. I mean, you know, this is, it's not as if this is a, a sort of, I mean, anyone knows anything about China, it's a very, very interesting civilization. It's, you know, it's deeply cu cultured, cultured. It's got some fine brains. You know, this is a this is a might. Th this is much mightier than the United States was in historical terms. I mean, America's only a few hundred years old. 
and, um, and was, you know, it was Europeans going to America that opened it up and so on. But in many ways it hasn't got much hinterland, whereas China's got a huge hinterland. The question is, can it convert that, if you like, those civilizational resources into something new? I was convinced, one of the things that most convinced about the Chinese, is a little anecdote, but my son is a violinist, he's 13, and he studied the uh, last three summers, not this one, under a professor at the Central Conservatory in Beijing. You know, unlike Indians, where you've kept your, in your instruments, bravo. You know, the Chinese are uh, uh, very attached to Western instruments. And, um, uh, and this guy was in his early 40s, and he was the most extraordinary teacher. I mean, I learned a lot. I used to go along. Ravi, my son, was learning the violin. Uh, I went along because, actually, Professor Lin Zhao Yang, which is his name, was, in my view, a philosopher. And so, and who, happened to, who, who happened to play, who had to be a great violinist. And I realized then, you know, there's great learning. This is a great, there's a hinterland uh, of learning. We'll see whether they can do what you're talking about or whether uh, they uh, fail uh, to, to do it. Um, and do I perceive India to be uh, a civilization state? Now, this is a really good question. I mean, it is, it is, and this is a question I think that uh, it needs a lot of thought amongst, you know, uh, in a lot of discussion here. I mean, in two senses, it's like China. Very, very old civilization, um, and uh, also a country of great diversity. Uh, one sense is different, which is that it's not a civilization state in the sense that it's had a independent polity over a very long historical period like China. India's only had it since 1947. So I think that China and India are not the same, but they do have things in common. So I've been very, one of the things that really struck me here, uh, being in India, um, two themes of discussion, race, I've talked about it, but the other, which comes up much more than anywhere else, and the other is, you know, you are, at, you know, Indians I notice, are comfortable with talking about the notion of civilization. Westerners, by and large, aren't really, they don't know how to use it. Whereas I think that that's, I mean, there was a, the article about my book and so on in the Economic Times, the headline was, um, China is a civilization state. Now, I, that has never appeared as a headline in any Western newspaper because they don't know what the hell I'm on about. But you do know what I'm on about. So I think, that, I think this is very interesting. And what I suspect what could happen is that the rise of China will legitimize wider forms of discussion of notions of polity. I mean, you alluded to the fact that there the are gray areas. There's not a, a, a Chinese war between civilization state and nation state. And I, I think that's true. And there's a book by Jiang Weiwei who uses my... Uh, which is one of the best in China, uses my idea of civilization today. In fact, he calls the book The Rise, China, China, The China Wave and the Rise of the Civilizational State. But, you know, he, I can see how he's doing, done in his approach what you're talking about. But I think there's a chance with the rise of China that it will legitimize non European nation state forms, that countries will explore what they are and what they come for. Because actually, you know, the great countries of the world, I mean, in the early discussion I was at the uh, at, um, university, um, at the... Um, JNU. Yeah, JNU. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was struggling for the initials there. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, someone was talking about Iran and the, and, 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 and the history of Iran in this context and also the Central, Central Asian Republics. And yesterday I took Ravi, my son, around. It was the only time we, break we've had in Delhi, but I took him around the Red Fort and it was a very, very good auto guide. Really good guide, excellent guide, uh, beautiful voice, beautiful English, but above all, historically very well informed and very, uh, very pertinent. And I was thinking about how to think about India in these terms as well, you know, to what extent. So all I can say is I don't know, you know, I, 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 my knowledge of India is extremely limited, so I'm not going to pontificate about it because I don't know uh, en enough about it. Um, but uh, it is a really interesting uh, question. Um, I didn't reply to your last question. Do you mind? Oh, that doesn't matter. Fine. Oh, well, thank you very much, and we've timed it beautifully. And, and, and that's my card. Um, so we've really had a, a most um, stimulating uh, two hours. Um, of course, for those of you um, uh, 
uh, who have access to the book either by purchase or library. Um, it's the, uh, what I can say, what I have read, a couple of hundred pages, this is tremendously well worth read. You don't have to agree with everything, but it is packed with, uh, with a tremendous amount of research, tremendous amount of thinking, lots of provocation, one doesn't as I said, agree, but it is something which I think anybody today, I mean, when we are trying, and for us, for everybody, but particularly for us in India, China is an incredibly important phenomenon. What is happening in China is incredibly important. Uh, and we need um, uh, every bit of help we can get from um, uh, thinkers around the world on how we should deal with China. I want to thank all of you uh, for, you know, one, stimulating questions, for being such a disciplined and marvelous audience. And really, Martin, this has been a wonderful afternoon. And I'm looking forward to reading the rest of the book. And um, thank you, Aspen Institute for organizing this. Thank you all very much. Um, okay. Well, be a pleasure. Keep in touch.